Hello, everyone. Um, I see the, the numbers are going up, so just sort of everyone's filing into today's seminar. So thank you very much uh, for joining us. Um, we'll just go ahead and get rolling. Um, my name is Joe Ali. I'm a seminar committee chair for the Berman Institute of Bioethics and delighted just to um, welcome everyone to today's seminar as part of our academic year seminar series. Um, we're very very pleased to have Maisha Cherry joining us today, who will be introduced briefly by my colleague, um, Travis Reeder, who's also on. Um, but before that, I just wanted to flag for those of you who are new to attendance that um, we'll have about 45 minutes of presentation followed by 15 minutes of discussion and Q&A. So you're very welcome to share uh, any questions or comments using the Q&A module or chat function in Zoom. Um, and uh, we're recording today's session, so if you have um, um, any concerns with that, you're welcome to, to um, not share any comments or questions in the Q&A. Um, if you have um, other issues, uh, technical issues throughout the seminar, please feel free to reach out to Suzanne Knizner or Ann Shook, who you can see on the panelist list, and they can help you with that. Um, with that, I'll just hand over to Travis for an introduction of our speaker. Thanks. Great, thank you, Joe. Um, it's my absolute honor to introduce Professor Maisha Cherry. And I uh, first learned about Dr. Cherry's work last summer, I believe, when I saw a piece of hers in the Atlantic. Um, it's the Atlantic, yeah, Anger Can Build a Better World. And I found it uh, really moving and compelling and insightful. And so I went and followed her on Twitter because that's what you do when you find interesting people. And uh, so shortly after it popped up on my timeline that she had a book coming out kind of on these themes. And so plug, just, just out. Um, so one of the reasons that I was hopeful we could get Dr. Sherry here is because the book just came out this month and I knew that um, there would be some, some interest in it and she would be doing some speaking. So uh, I believe that we're going to hear about rage renegades today, which um, probably has to do a little bit with the book, The Case for Rage. And so um, my, Dr. Maisha Cherry is Assistant Professor of Philosophy at the University of California, Riverside. Her research is primarily concerned with the role of emotions and attitudes in public life. Dr. Cherry's books include Unmuted, Conversations on Prejudice, Oppression, and Social Justice, that's with OUP, and co-edited co -edited with Owen Flanagan, The Moral Psychology of Anger. Her latest book, The Case for Rage, Why Anger is Essential to the Anti-Racist Struggle, is also with OUP. Her work on emotions and race has appeared in The Atlantic, Boston Review, Los Angeles Times, Salon, Huffington Post, Womankind, and New Philosopher Magazine. Dr. Sherry is also the host of the Unmute podcast, where she interviews philosophers about the social and political issues of our day. So thank you very much, Professor Sherry, for joining us here, and the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Travis, for that introduction. I want to try to share my screen here. Um, I also want to thank everyone for coming out, and I'm looking forward to discussing these ideas with you. OK, so um, I'm glad that Travis plugged the book, and I didn't have to do that first. Um, this is a chapter uh, from the book. Is uh, the I guess you can say the chapter to the last chapter, next to the last chapter, um, called Rage Renegades and Message to Allies. So in response, to the 2020 police killings of George Floyd in Minneapolis, Minnesota, Breonna Taylor in Louisville, Kentucky, and the subsequent deaths of other Black people at the hands of the police, Americans and those in solidarity with them across the world marched to protest racism, racial inequality, and police brutality. Reportedly, 70 protests per week occurred in US cities during the spring and summer of that year. The city that got the majority of media attention is Portland, Oregon. Portland protesters demonstrated for over 120 days, but it's not just the duration or the politicization of the protests that makes Portland stand out in my mind, is that the protests were happening in one of the whitest cities in America, and the protests had been overwhelmingly attended by whites. This shows that it wasn't just racial minorities who were angry at racism, whites were too. It wasn't just young people protesting either. Middle-aged white women, known as the Portland Wall of Moms, joined the protests, followed by the Wall of Dads and Wall of Veterans groups formed to protect frontline demonstrators from police. With fists raised, 
hands up and clutch cardboard signs conveying messages like white silence equals violence, use your white privilege to end white privilege. And this is a revolt against racism. Many protesters express their solidarity with blacks and their anger at racism. Some were arrested for their defiance, even grabbed by unidentified federal agents in place of unmarked bands. Others, like former Navy officer Christopher J. David, was tear gassed and beaten with batons by agents. After the video of the incident went viral, the 53-year-old responded in an interview like a true white ally. If I had been a black veteran that had gotten beaten down, do you think I would have gotten as much attention as I did, he rhetorically asked the journalist. To decenter himself and his whiteness, he added, it isn't about me getting beat up. It's about focusing back on the original intention of all these protests, which is Black Lives Matter. Laudian rage, the kind of anti-racist anger that I defend in the book, is not just anger that racially marginalized people have in response to injustice. We will hope that people in solidarity with the oppressed allies will also have this anti-racist anger, particularly if they value all members of a society, that they judge that racial injustice is wrong, that they do not consider themselves free until all people are free, and they aim to resist racist systems. These are what I refer to as rage renegades. And they are rage renegades because although their privilege and place in a white supremacist society is meant to guarantee that they will be complicit with or engage in racism as a way to maintain racial domination, they instead show outrage at this society. And in doing so, they rebel against a racist system that was designed to benefit them. Although allyship can be helpful to people and movements, allies must not behave in ways that maintain the very systems of oppression that they are aiming to challenge and resist. Those with Lordian rage can value, produce, and resist, but there are negative things an ally with Lordian rage can also do and we need to be mindful of them. Renegade raging can go wrong. Starting out, it's important to note that simply having the right intentions isn't a get out of jail free card. As philosopher Veronica Ivey, previously Rachel McKinnon has noted, coming to understand how to properly engage in an anti-racist project is understanding it's going to be a lot of work and it's more work when you don't have the identity, end quote. Now, I'm not implying that the racially oppressed are immune from any kind of wrongdoing when they have what I'm referring to as an order of rage. Anyone can do wrong. But focusing on allies here provides a helpful window into the unique harms rage renegades can potentially inflict. Likewise, my intention is not to focus on allies in order to call out white people or other racial groups. People go wrong as allies because they are human not because they are one race or another. And this is not about making people, making you feel guilty either. By taking a look at the challenges allies face and the way their rage can go wrong, I hope to help allies guard against using their Lordian rage in ways that reify the very racist system the anger is responding to. Now, there are all sorts of controversy when it comes to allies. Even the term ally is not without controversy. One common position is that we should abandon the term. The actions of allies are also controversial. Grassroots activists and writers have illustrated the myriad ways in which allies can marginalize Black, Indigenous, and people of color, and they have shown us in the forms of do's and don'ts and critical analyses. When Christopher J. David, the white Portland protester noted earlier, serves as an ally exemplar, Portland Wall of Moms' earlier actions hit at many thinkers' concerns. Some local organizations accuse them of anti-Blackness for excluding Black moms, failing to protect Black protesters, failing to consult Black leadership, and co-opting BLM for their own purposes. They were, for so many others, allies behaving badly. Around the same time in Portland, an anonymous non-Black woman of color, dubbed Naked Athena by the internet, decided to use her body as a shield between demonstrators and federal agents in a different way than the wall groups. 
describing her decision as a result of a fury that arose in her. She stood nude in front of agents, striking yoga poses while standing, spreading her legs open while sitting. Although she had good intentions, for some, it was a moment that upstaged the movement. As these examples and criticisms have pointed out, allyship, the label and its participants is fraught. There are lots of ways of doing it wrong. For our purposes though, we need to examine the unique ways in which allies with Lordian rage can behave badly in order to get us closer to a full picture of Lordian's rage role in the fight against racism. So how can allies do horrible things specifically with their anti-racist anger? So one way in which renegade raging can go wrong is when allies think that their feelings in response to racism are equal to, synonymous with, or can compare to the feelings and the realities of the oppressed. They might think that because they share in Lordian rage, they also feel the same as the oppressed. So we might hear an ally say, we are both angry and mean it in ways that ignore the nuances of racism and how racism affects people's lives differently. However, the same feeling does not equate to the same experience. Although we might have similar emotional responses to a target, this does not mean that we are impacted by it or feel its impact in the same way. Although rage may unify or join us together in solidarity, it does not unify us in a metaphysical sense. It does not literally make us one. A rage renegade behaves badly by ignoring this important difference. As we see after the deaths of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor, many white people were stirred by racism in the US, particularly by the police, uh, by the police against black people like never before. And this was a great development. People of all races and ethnicities took to the streets Statues of Confederates came down, buildings were renamed, some police reformers were put in place, and in various ways, small steps were made to get us closer to racial equality. But in the midst of this, had a white protester claimed to know how her black fellow protester felt in this heated moment, she would have misstepped. Not having lived as a black person in this country, and had been raised to carry herself differently in order to navigate hostile spaces, she just couldn't have really known. So why is it different to feel solidarity with someone than to actually feel the way they feel? Now, it's not because rage renegades have a different kind of anger, such as empathetic rage, a rage a person feels by imagining himself in the shoes of Dalits in India, people formerly designated as untouchable based on the caste system, for example, as opposed to the loading of rage that many marginalized people feel. This kind of rage, at least for David Hume, is only an impression of what the oppressed person actually feels. If the rage renegade was feeling this rage, then the mistake he would be making would be clear. There is no way his rage could be the same as oppressed Dalits since what he is a feeling is only an impression of what members of the Dalit community are experiencing. However, I do not think rage renegades think they are experiencing empathetic rage. Outrage allies often report that they are experiencing anger at racism, anger that someone is being racially oppressed and anger that they themselves live in a racially oppressive system. This is not vicarious anger. What they claim to have is the very same rage that the oppressed feel. So they're not in error because they're mistaken about the nature of their rage. They are making a different kind of error. An ally, and thinking that he feels as the oppressed also feels, not only commits a metaphysical mistake, but a moral one. He minimizes people's experiences of injustice and reduces them to an emotion. Our emotional experiences are never quite identical. More importantly, feeling loading rage in response to injustice is not the same as feeling what the oppressed feels. It is not the same as feeling the emotions that arise due to and as a result of the rage, such as vulnerability, victimization, and pain. Just because a person is outraged 
does not mean that he now had phenomenology or faced the discomforting and disheartening reality of racially oppressed people. Not only should a race renegade not think that they feel the same as the marginalized, they also shouldn't think that their loading and rage makes them now know how it feels to be marginalized. This is an epistemic mistake. An ally might think that because they have loading rage, they understand oppressed people's experience and what they are feeling in response to them. They might say, I totally understand, I'm angry too, when an Asian American shares her experiences of discrimination. They convey through their response that they understand or overstand in this case, what the woman feels in a way that is overly confident and not sympathetic. They are overconfident because they think that there's a strong link between their rage as an ally and knowledge. Knowledge that can only come from firsthand experience of injustice. This is not to say that there's no connection between knowledge and anger. Lordian rage involves knowledge of racism. Also, feminists have argued quite convincingly that anger has epistemic advantages. Anger can, quote, enable us to perceive the world differently than we would from its portrayal and conventional descriptions. And it may provide the first indications that something is wrong with the way alleged facts have been constructed with accepted understandings of how things are, according to philosopher Alison Jagger. However, having loading rage does not make anyone a know-it-all about oppression. If you think you already know something, you do not listen when someone explains it to you. If a person thinks she knows all about how another person truly feels because she too is angry about racism, she blocks herself off from remaining curious, humble, and open to continue learning about the experience of the marginalized and the reality of racism. We do not learn this by being angry. We learn it by listening to the experiences of others and giving up willful ignorance and then just a couple of things. These activities are what allies should be engaged in. Knowledge is not transferred through emotional experiences alone. We obtain it through hard, sympathetic, patient, and humble work. For this reason, we can understand the original criticisms of Portland's wall of moms. No matter what emotions they may have felt for Black lives and expressed at the system, their critics believe that their initial failure to listen to local Black leadership limited their allyship and caused harm. Allowing loading rage to engender a false certainty, prevents learning and awareness, both which are needed in order to engage in anti-racist struggle. But ignorance and lack of awareness also prevent allies from seeing their unique position. Rage renegades should recognize where they stand in relation to the racially marginalized. No matter how much rage they may have, they are still more privileged and socially positioned in ways the racially marginalized are not. And as a result, allies are in a position to harm and help in specific ways. In order to guard against harming and engage in helping instead, they must not forget where they stand. Having loading and rage is a good thing. But when allies think that their rage makes them know what it's like or how it feels to be oppressed by a racist system, it doesn't do anyone any good. Another way in which rage renegades can behave badly with their rage is when they think that their anger matters more than the anger of the racially marginalized. So I believe that there's a connection between value, respect, and anger. If a person thinks that he has value, when he is mistreated, he will feel that he has been denied the respect that he deserves, and he will have a right to be angry in response. When we look at Western history, it is white men, not indigenous peoples, who have been said to have legitimate claims to anger. While of course, people of all races, including white people, can be denied respect and feel rage as a result, society has been structured in such a way that only whites were assumed to start out with legitimate respect, so that taking that respect away would be worthy of anger. As we know, non-whites have frequently been disrespected, often because of who they are racially. But because they didn't start out with the social perception of deserving respect, denying them respect would not be for dominant whites worthy of their anger. As a result, the way we perceive anger is deeply racialized, 
It reads different depending on who has it. Just as whites are seen as having more of a claim to anger than people of color, men are often seen as being more righteous in their anger than women. The 2008 Brett Kavanaugh and Dr. Christine Blasey Ford Senate hearings illustrate this. By the end of the day, race matters when it comes to rage. White women, because of their whiteness, have claims to anger given the value attached to their whiteness. So consider Amy Cooper's rage in Central Park when Christian Cooper simply asked her to leash her dog. Out of self-preservation, a black bird a watcher, Christian Cooper stayed calm as he could be throughout the non-viral interaction. Cooper felt no shame in raising her voice when she called the police. She assumed they would be on her side. She had been conditioned to temper her emotions, as Kristen Cooper had, due to the privilege that is conferred on her to her race. As Eduardo Bonilla Silva's work shows us, this illustrates the racial asymmetry of feeling grooves. In a white supremacist society, some people's emotions and their claims to value and respect will be accepted, while other people's emotions will not be. And this will be based on their racial identity. A 2019 Saturday Night Live skit entitled Impossible Hawk illustrates quite brilliantly the value of the anger and fear of white women in comparison to black men. In the skit, black British actor Juice Elba plays Bruce Banner, a scientist who has an accident in his lab. As a result of the accident, when Bruce gets angry, he transforms into a quote, emboldened white lady when he is provoked, end quote. And there are different scenes in which he transforms. Each instance highlights the difference between how his anger is viewed as a black man versus when he is a white woman. The clip is on YouTube. You should definitely check it out. So while shopping in the clothing store, Bruce pays for a shirt he thinks is a certain price. When he realizes the price is different from advertised, he asks for a refund. However, the white cashier refuses to give him his money back. He protests and reports that he is about to get angry. The cashier then threatens to call security. Soon, Bruce transforms him into an emboldened white woman, what the internet will call a Karen. As a white woman, he proclaims, quote, I want my money back right now, end quote. He then proceeds to call the police with the cell phone. In response, the cashier tells him to take his money back and that it's fine to do so. Now, this is a very different reaction than the one he received as a black man. His anger is respected when he is a white woman, but not when he is a black man. It's a hilarious satirical sketch, but the point that underlines it is a very serious one, resulting from racism, injustice, and oppression. The respect that is given to his anger is connected to the perceived legitimacy of his claims to value and respect. As a white woman, he's given everything he wants when he is angry. Since his position in society entitles him to all the respect in the world. As a black man, his anger is undeserved and treated as a danger. Now in the next scene, Bruce go downstairs at 2 a.m. to tell his black neighbors who are having a party to turn their music down. They refuse and tell him that he should just move to another building. When he says that he will get upset, they respond, go ahead, cuz. Bruce then transforms into an emboldened white woman. Only then, do they tell him that they would turn the music down? Once again, his emotional responses and requests are respected only when he is a white woman, but not when he is a black man. The Impossible Hawk skit reminds us that the extent to which a person's anger will be taken seriously is often based on their racial identity. The uptake of the anger is connected to the value we think the person possesses. And in a patriarchal white supremacist society, we will think that some lives matter more than others, and thus the anger of some people matters more than that of others. This will lead us to take the anger of those who we think matter more, more seriously, and to think, if we are a member of a racially dominant group, that our anger matters more than others. Now, how is this connected to allyship? Well, a white ally might also think that his anger at racial injustice matters more than the anger of the indigenous person who is experiencing injustice. When an ally thinks that his anger matters more than others, this doesn't mean that he also thinks an indigenous person's anger or life does not matter. 
But the angry ally is not in the clear because of this. An ally can still behave badly, even with their Lodian rage, if they think that their anger matters more. This is again, due to the prioritization of his white perceptions of value of himself and of others. The rage renegade is likely to have arrived at the judgment from a hierarchical vital framework. That is to say, he might think perhaps unconsciously that the lives of racialized minorities only matter because his whiteness has declared them to matter. He might think that his valuation of them matters more than their own valuation of themselves. And indeed, it will be hard for him to not think this when his anger on their behalf is listened to and acted upon so much more than the anger of their own behalf. Just like the impossible hawk, his white anger has a very different effect than the anger of the indigenous persons would. Given the respect that our society assumes white people and only white people are due. Since volume is connected to anger, he might therefore think that his Lordian rage matters more than theirs. Given this claim, it would not be surprising if the ally came to volume the lives of certain racialized folk because their lives were previously valued by other whites, thereby making them worthy candidates for him to ascribe volume. A rage renegade who thinks that his anger matters more than the anger of the oppressed can engage in a variety of destructive actions. He may focus more on how he and other rage renegades feel than how members of the oppressed group feel. Whether he realizes it or not, what would be most important to him is what white people say the other white people he's connected with on social media are feeling in response to indigenous people's experiences of racial violence and marginalization rather than what indigenous peoples with whom he might not even have any personal ties are feeling about their own experiences. As a result, a rage renegade may chronicle or express his lording and rage without any desire to give voice to how the marginalized are feeling. If an ally has a blog or a podcast, he will only talk about his feelings of rage rather than interview a friend of color, provide an opportunity for his Arab American coworker to speak about her anger. When a person of color is reporting their loading and rage, an ally might attempt to one-up her in the emotional department. Rather than listening to someone who has endured racial mistreatment firsthand, his focus will be on voicing his own anger. He does this by attempting to outdo others emotionally. If a person is angry, the one-upper will report that he is angrier. If a person is angry due to a recent racial incident, the one-upper will report that he has always been angry. What is morally problematic about this kind of behavior? Well, many things. First, a rage renegade who thinks that his rage matters more than the oppressed is likely to not see people of color as having inherent value. Now, if asked, he would say, of course they do, but his actions portray an unjust attitude he likely does not detect in himself. They only have value because whites have ascribed value to them, or they only have value because whites agree with the ascription. Now, this is not an act of resistance against white supremacist claims. It is a kind of volume that is very much rooted in white supremacy. A person who only thinks that Black people have value because his anger co-signs it or makes it so is an ally of the worst kind. This is because the very foundations of his allyship are built on a white supremacist foundation. The transformative possibilities of his voting rage are also likely to be negatively impacted as a result. Even if a white ally does not have the extreme non-inherent valuation beliefs we have seen, thinking that rage renegades anger matters more than the anger of the oppressed is still harmful. This is because it communicates that white people's feelings are more important than those of racial minorities. And this reifies a racial hierarchy that says that white emotions, judgments, and perceptions have more value than others simply because they are held by those who are white. A way not to give in to this tendency, to think or at least communicate that white feelings matter more than the feelings of other groups, is to give people of color space to express their rage. To give space means to decenter or to take the focus off oneself if one is white and allow the vulnerable to be seen and heard and to put their rage front and center. This is what the retired Navy officer in Portland was modeling in his interview. 
In order to do so, a person must be able to distinguish routine, appropriating, and amplifying the Lordian rage of others and choose the latter. This means sometimes suppressing the urge to let everyone know that even though you are white, you are angry on behalf of others, for example, and instead being quiet so that black folks can speak for themselves. For allies, it's often proves to be easier said than done. Appropriating the loading and rage of others is quite similar to appropriating the culture of others, at least the primatic forms of doing so. In cultural appropriation, a person from a dominant group performs the art form associated with the culture that is not their own, one that enjoys less privilege, and often does not give credit to the group that they have appropriated from. When a rage renegade appropriates the loading and rage of others, she uses her rage in a way that fails to address the sufferings of non-whites, which is the source of the rage. The rage becomes about her feelings, her experiences, her worries. She may also aim to gain attention for her rage and receive it, while ignoring the fact that there are people of color who are also outraged and that their voices, feelings, and testimonies could get more attention if she would just get out of the way. This is an example of what Michael Denzel Smith means by using allyship as a self-congratulatory, a career as a way of centering one's experiences at the expense of the marginalized. Amplifying the lower rage of others is different from appropriating it. Amplification entails letting anger speak of the unjust conditions of others and not one's own situation, decentering oneself and providing a platform for the marginalized to speak. This form of allyship is effective and does right by the loading rage of the oppressed. It may also include moving to the back of the line during a protest, refusing to sign your name first on a petition, or declining to speak on a racism panel and recommending a Black person instead. Amplifying the loading rage of others, when we too have loading rage, may be difficult to do since anger is so personal and we are the persons feeling it, evaluating the injustice, being moved to do something about racism. This may also be hard to do since rage renegades are used to living in a society that prioritizes their experiences, perspectives, and feelings. However, an ally must remember that even with passion, intensity, and good intentions, they could still be participating in the silencing of vulnerable people's stories and experiences by making themselves and their anger the focus, thus communicating that their anger is more important. Race renegades do not fight against racial discrimination and white supremacy when they do this. They contribute to racial injustice instead. An ally can also behave badly with their loading and rage when they use their rage performatively to show off how virtuous they are in a practice that has been called moral grandstanding. In the context of loading and rage, a person who participates in moral grandstanding uses rage to project a positive image of himself he uses his rage for self-promotion, aiming to make himself look woke rather than aiming at defeating racism by publicly expressing outrage at it. Now, there are various ways a person can perform moral grandstanding, but let's call uh, this kind of grandstanding for our context, moral anger grandstanding. Allies who participate in moral anger grandstanding do it because they want to be perceived as exceptionally moral and anti-racist, and they use their rage as evidence of this fact. They might exaggerate their emotions. Imagine they're reporting, I am angry too, or I'm so beyond outrage, most likely on social media, where all can see and be impressed by their righteous anger. To bring attention to their own rage, allies might feign intense expressions of it, or they might self-report their anger in order to get praise and acceptance. They might express how angry they are in front of people of color in order to stand out as a good white person, or they might announce publicly to their Latinx friends that they are often angry at racism, racist immigration practices so that their racial values and politics can be applauded. Now, this may sound cynical. To be clear, allies are not always making such proclamations insincerely. Rage renegades could, in fact, be expressing anger at racial injustice, and it could come from genuinely wanting to see things change rather than only wanting to look a certain way. But undeniably, at least one of the more anger grand standards goals is this, to project an image that he is a good white person. His reasons for doing so are not necessarily to make the oppressed feel safe or secure or to strengthen solidarity ties. After all, plenty of whites express what have been called performative wokeness for all of their all white, 99% white Facebook friends. Instead, the purpose of expressing his rage 
is to showcase his own morality. Now, how might this be harmful? Now, philosophers Justin Tosi and Brandon Warmke claim that general moral grandstanding, moral grandstanding where a person uses moral talk to project a certain image contributes to polarization since making strong moral claims in order to outdo others can lead for them to refuse to listen to people on the other side of the political aisle. And they argue that this kind of grandstanding devalues moral talk since people will be less apt to take moral conversation seriously. But what about what we are referring to moral anger grandstanding? I think that moral anger grandstanding has different effects. And what is worrisome, according to some critics, about the term ally is that those who refer to themselves as such are often concerned with using the label as a sort of certification. They often identify themselves with the label without putting in the work involved in being an ally. Now, I want to make a slightly different claim here concerning grandstanding. Rage Winner Gates might be so concerned with being identified as someone who is angry at racial injustice that they do not take advantage of the motivational and productive features of the rage. Projecting the image of the angry ally is often all that they use their rage for. And it's not just that they are inactive, they are misusing what I refer to as the fuel features found in Lorian rage. Lorian rage provides the fuel of eagerness, optimism, and self-belief to motivate anti-racist action. When a rage renegades participates in moral anger grandstanding, the fuel of Lorian rage is being used for identification and not anti-racist action. And in the words of Audre Lorde, this is a waste of energy. When an ally uses Lordy Rage to morally grandstand, she might also think that she is immune to criticism because she thinks that her Lordy Rage makes her a good white person. She can become resistant to any kind of moral criticism. If her South Asian classmates point out a racist act that she has participated in, or a racist attitude that she might have expressed, the moral anger grandstander will think that the criticism is not fitting because she cannot possibly be racist or engage in racist actions because, well, she has anti-racist anger. And she thinks this because she believes that the emotion exonerates her from any kind of wrongdoing. In her eyes, she is angry at racial injustice and therefore exceptional, and she needs you to believe this too. When a rage renegade thinks that she is immune to criticism, then even when she is called out and held accountable, she is more likely to continue to engage in actions that are detrimental to the goals of marginalized group and contribute to the perpetuation of injustice. While allies can do this without rage, renegade rages are likely to go a step further. In response to the criticism, a rage renegade may use her Lordian rage to block the accusation of racism. She would have anger in response to criticism since she would think that the criticism itself is perhaps racist or an instance of racial injustice. And she would be motivated by her anger to end the injustice. Imagine the black friends of a rage renegade calling her out for her anti-blackness or questioning her solidarity. In response, she then expresses anger by saying, no, you're the racist or you're being divisive. This is likely to create a cycle the rage renegade responds to the accusation of Lordy and Rage, while our friends respond to the original racist act or attitude of, with Lordy and Rage. The racial behavior is unlikely to be corrected, and those who are affected are unlikely to be heard as a result. Moral anger grandstanding is also harmful when a person thinks that his anti-racist anger makes him sub morally superior to other whites and even other members of the oppressed group whose anger is not as present, strong, or loud as his. A rage renegade might think that because he has only a rage, he is therefore morally better than others. This might lead him to feel contempt for them. It might also create a self-designed moral hierarchy in which he judges and ranks everyone else's emotions and thus their morality. For example, a rage renegade might think that he is morally better than those other white liberals who do not have Lordian rage. He might even think that he is more virtuous or blacker than the black person who fails to meet his level of anger. He may then begin to look at them with scorn or disrespect since their rage does not match his own. He may even judge them as morally inferior, insufficiently involved in democracy, uninformed and unaffected by suffering, and thus lower on the moral and political ladder than he is. Beyond just being unfair to others, developing these attitudes, could distract him from what should be the goal, combating racism. 
While having loading and rage may signal an attunement to injustice, a certain moral judgment, and a just inclusive perspective, it does not signal moral superiority. This is morally problematic, particularly since the construction of moral hierarchies is a strategy that race is often used in projects of racial domination. In these projects, they view certain people as morally superior and others as morally inferior. They create a hierarchy based on this characterization. They also justify treatment and mistreatment, protection and elimination based on the moral hierarchy, holding consent and creating hierarchies, although of a different nature than races, are examples of how renegade rage can lead to reinforcing strategies and projects of racial domination rather than resisting them. Now, Veronica Ivey argues that one thing that we expect allies to do is to use their social position to help the group that they are in solidarity with. An example of this is when a white man uses his leadership position to hire minorities, or when a white woman uses her white privilege to challenge the police who racially profile Latinx teens in her Brooklyn neighborhood. Or another example is when white women protesters use their bodies as shields to protect black protesters from the police, as they did in the 2020 Louisville, Kentucky protests calling for justice and the death of Breonna Taylor. But I think that there are ways in which allies can use their social position to an extreme. And this is the last ways in which renegade raging can go wrong. White saverism is an example of such an extreme and an additional way that allies behave badly with their anti-racist anger. Now white saverism is service acts by members of a dominant group who think that other racial groups of people need saving and they only, that only they can save them. What also separates these service acts from pure acts of solidarity is that white saverism centers the morality of whites. It's also about having a big emotional experience, the good feeling of protesting to get something off your chest rather than ending injustice. Lastly, those who engage in white saverism tend to help non-whites in self-serving ways and view them as helpless. So let's address each of these in turn to see how they can play out in Lordy and Rage. An ally can use their anger at racism to center the morality of white folks. By centering this morality, the focus of the anti-racist anger becomes about the goodness of white people rather than about addressing and ending the injustice that brought the rage about. So here's another satirical example that I think will illuminate this point. In a 2019 spoof on NBC's Late Night with Seth Meyers entitled White Savior, the movie trailer. Comedian Seth Meyers plays every white savior archetype in movies such as The Green Book and Hidden Figures. And his anger at racism is in the service of showing his black friend the goodness of white people despite the existence of a few racist and prejudiced one. Now, each riffs on a movie set in the Jim Crow South. And when he expresses anger at white people for being appalled that his black friend is using the white owned bathroom, at white men for intimidating her in a bar, and at white men for being overly aggressive towards her, Maya's character does not does it to illustrate just how good white people can be. He doesn't do it to challenge systemic racism or to criticize his white friend's racist views. His first lines in the spoof, spoken at a press conference, sum up his intentions perfectly. As he adjusts the mic of his accomplished black friend, who achieved some, some success despite racism. He takes attention away from her moment and seeks attention from, for his own goodness instead. Quote, her mic was too high, but I fixed it. It's fixed because of me, he says. In other words, rather than focuses on systemic issues or racist policy, he is focused on getting credit for being her savior. Then although using Lordy and Rage to center the morality of whites is similar to moral and grandstanding, it is also quite different. When a member of a racially dominant group has stolen rage and participates in white saverism, they can use their rage to show how good, empathetic, and rebellious white people are. Now, all of them are racist is something they might attempt to prove. The focus of this morality is not necessarily themselves as individuals, as in the case of grandstanding, but white people in general. Their rage serves to redeem and center whiteness. The traits of goodness and empathy that emanate from whiteness is what the rage begins to represent. Centering the morality of whites turns lording and rage into a badge of white honor. When one person wears the badge, it stands in proxy for many other whites. At least that is the thought. So let me just make you know a, a kind of a quick point about white saverism. That it's not only about centering white morality, but it also involves prioritizing white allies, angry emotional experiences, 
And in doing so, I believe that injustice can get, can get ignored. And we kind of misuse the Lordian features of a rage, which is not to showcase white morality, but to combat racism. So let me just uh, sum up uh, the talk in these words. I believe that rage renegades can do harm with their Lordian rage when they think that their rage, when they think that the same feelings equate to the same experiences of the racially marginalized and that their rage matters more than that of the oppressed. They can also do harm with their rage when they engage in anger, moral grandstanding and white saberism. When an ally can behave badly in numerous other ways, as we have seen, there are unique harms they can enact through rage. Now, I think that this critical analysis is important for the additional barriers to productive allyship and covers, and for how it reveals the often invisible ways in which social positions can pollute even our most fitting and laudable emotional responses to injustice. Unquestionably, the presence of allies is a good thing, overall for anti-racist struggle. But to properly harness the potential that these allies' goodwill and attention can bring, allies must tackle the barriers we have seen so that they can continue to participate in anti-racist efforts in ways that are productive rather than self-serving, distracting, or even counterproductive. Engaging in anti-racist work is not easy. There are minds to change, ideologies to resist, and racist systems to challenge. But this is not to say that the greatest enemy or the greatest threat, threat is always forces from the outside. Those who are angry at racism can also do great harm. And if we are not honest about the ways in which this can occur, we will be unable to do the real work of achieving or achieving for achieving justice in an unjust world. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Cherry. I, I hate it that we're virtual and you don't give me applause at the end. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but just trust me that there are lots of people out there uh, who are really grateful that you took time out to speak with us. Um, it usually takes a few minutes for people to drop questions in the chat. So I've got a, I get to take um, moderator's prerogative here. Okay. So here's a, a kind of philosopher's question. There are lots of non-philosophers in the audience too, but um, it seems like there are two different things that we could be talking about when it comes to justifiability of anger and rage. We could be talking about the justifiability of having the emotion. And then we could talk about the justifiability of expressing the emotion. And I take it that some of what you didn't do today, but you do in, in your popular work and in the book is make the case for this Lordian rage as a permissible form of rage to feel, to experience. Mm -hmm. And then I, I want to kind of lay this out and you can correct me or, or give me some details, steer it. It sounds like today's talk was a little bit more about how the expression of mm -hmm. the anger can misfire. Mm -hmm. And so one, I want to hear your thoughts about that. Um, and then two, I kind of wonder what you think about allies having the actual experience of mm. rage. If there's, um, if it's just as justifiable, like, you know, Lordian rage is, is a potentially good thing to have, or if there's actually a problem with the experience too, and not just with the expression. So mm. that was a lot. Um, but Interesting, uh, interesting. I mean, it, I think you're absolutely right that one of the things that I'm trying to defend in the book is the experience. Um, but I'm also trying to also defend the expression, right? Um, and you're, 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 you're absolutely right to kind of pick up a current in this particular chapter, which is simply suggesting that things can go awry in experiencing it, because while you're experiencing it, there's certain kind of things, beliefs that can be embedded in that experience that can be enacted in action, right? So, so you know, or not, right? Um, so I want to tackle that, but I also want to tackle the ways in which um, when you express that anger, what it can communicate and, and what, it, what it can do, the destructive things that it, that it can particularly do. And I think in the converse, what I'm doing in the book is kind of saying the same thing, right? So um, um, the power of loading rage is that it has this power in the expression itself, like the, I mean, in the expression, which I don't think is controversial. I think people, would, but I also think that there's some power in experience in it as well. Um, so I wanna, I wanna do like a parallel that, that the power is present in the experience and the expression, but things can also go awry, mm -hmm. not just in the expression, but also in the experiences in experience as well. Now, I, I, I wanna think a little bit more about the latter piece of your question about the experience piece. Um, and it seems to be, you seem to be suggesting, is it possible for allies to actually experience the same, the same? Yeah, so I certainly don't want to ask if they can experience the same, but um, 
here's the background. So the reason okay. I was immediately attracted to, to you having a conversation about anger is because I take it that like a very outdated but sort of classical seductive view of emotion right. is that there's positive, positive and negative emotions. Mm -hmm. Anger is one of the negative emotions. So it's right. like be good if we didn't have them in some sense. Mm -hmm. And then I always thought that was strange because if the world is objectively messed up, right, right, right. There, are, there are cases where you, it's apt to be angry. Right, right, right. right, right. I take it that Lordy and Rage is supposed to be um, making sense of that. Mm -hmm. And so I would, my assumption, I guess my working assumption is that allies ought to be angry, that they mm -hmm. ought to have some rage, but that then they have to be really careful about how to do the expression. Right. right? Mm -hmm. And so I was just wondering about that first step because that was the sort of assumption in the background. And I wondered if, if you thought it was right. That yeah, well, definitely. That is, that is right. I mean, I want to be careful about the should be angry because one of the things I'm trying to argue in the book is not necessarily that we should be angry as to suggest that if you're not, if you're not angry, then there's a lot of things going on there. I mean, one might pursue that as a project. One of the things that I'm trying to, 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 to say is for those who are angry, here's a resource to help you make sense of the anger to help you make use of the anger. Those who are critical of anger, here's something that may, may address some of your worries, right? So I, I, I'm always careful about uh, being very careful about the normative aspects of anyone feeling any kind of emotion because I just think emotions are what they are that I can't will myself to feel any kind of way, right? But I do wanna speak, speak to people who've already feel the emotion. Um, I wanna speak to them, right? So there's no doubt that I think that um, I, I will expect in some ways, and that's why I call them rage renegades, because these are allies who already feel the emotion of, 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 of this anti-racist anger. But I want to say that it's not, it's not just enough to feel the emotion, feeling that you've done um, the anti-racist work as a result of feeling it. Because one of the things that I want to say, as in the case of any of us who experience anger, that can go awry, right? Aristotle was very clear about that. So I also want to remind allies that although you feel this anger, that can go awry in very, a very unique unique ways and I want to I want to address that but it's it can also go right in the experience it's fitting when they do no doubt and I will want some allies to be angry right but I don't want to form a kind of a normative thing but I want them to be careful because even in that experience and the expression got to be careful that you don't reinforce the same thing that you're fighting against very interesting okay and I would and let me just point to that, that, that negative point you were talking about, that there are what we call positive emotions and then there are what we call negative emotions. Um, and they're based on the evaluations that we have to the thing that aroused our emotions. So let me say that in a much clearer way. Um, happiness is in response to a positive evaluation of my world. I am happy because I get to speak to some brilliant people at Johns Hopkins today, right? I'm positively evaluating you all, right? Um, but sadness can occur when I have a negative evaluation of the target, right? So I've watched a film that just made me feel awful about marriage, scenes from a marriage, right? It made me feel awful about marriage. I negatively involved, I negati negatively evaluated what I just saw, right? Same thing with anger, right? Anger comes about as a negative evaluation of injustice, right? Um, so it's, it's not necessarily that negative translates to negative bad, but it's negative bad in the sense that what I'm evaluating is a bad thing. So when, when you have any kind of negative emotion, it's not the negative emotion that's the problem. It's a negative context that, arise, that arouses that particular negative emotion. And as long as we live in an imperfect society, in a non-ideal society, we are going to have negative emotions. And one of the things that I suggest at the end of the book, in a question that's titled The End of Rage, the question should not be when would anger cease, but when would the injustice that anger is evaluating cease? That's what I'm more interested in. Very nice. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I could follow up you, you a bunch okay. of times. I'm, I'm going to ask Joe if anything's come in or if he wants to, to weigh in, because um, otherwise I'll just keep talking to you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't see others. Um, let's see, I think there's one comment here that just came in. Maybe we could take that uh, from David. It says, uh, there's an idea in the medical era world that the most effective advocates for radical change are angry moms, mothers against drunk driving, Sorrel King, mm -hmm. and others. So, um, mm -hmm. yeah, I wonder maybe David. I don't know if you want to expand on that more in the chat, but I, I guess if you have some initial reactions or thoughts there, um, in terms of how you know that that aligns or doesn't align with, um, you know, thinking around social movements and the like, that would be great. I'm glad, David, you mentioned that. That's something that I um, I grew up, you know, during that era in which moms were outraged about a lot of 
accidents that was happening, we were drunk driving. Um, and I just didn't make the connection between, and there was the anger of them losing their children that they can create these organizations. And we have a tendency to think that anger is only acting kind of like a general social injustice framework, but we know that it's motivated a lot of movement and a lot of change. And that's what I'm trying to remind people of. Like these moms did not go and loot <laughs> and burn uh, down buildings or decided to slash the throats of people who was at liquor stores, right? They were able to use that anger to galvanize to form a movement to help people. And, and I, wanna, I wanna make an analogy here um, that in a racial context, sometimes I think that it's hard. A lot of this has to do with just racist attitudes about people who are expressing anger. Um, but just to remind ourselves, and you know, there's a chapter in the book in which I address this called Raging Work Clothes. Remind ourselves that, that, that anger has always been, I mean, when we think about social movements throughout the United States, has always been a galvanizing force um, that allowed people, that motivated people uh, to do very uh, constructive things. And I kind of suggest uh, that a lot of it has to do with what anger does to our brain. It makes us believe that we can change Whatever it is, just really gives us that self confidence, that self belief. Moms, right? It gave them that confidence. Um, and it also allows us to take certain kind of risks. Um, um, and so it's those wonderful things I like about the emotion that it's just has been so pivotal in a lot of transformation. I mean, we think about this country, 1776, our founders were not happy about what the king was doing. I mean, that was just frustration. Beyond frustration, it was anger. Um, so I just want to remind people that anger has a positive role to play. And, and if we use it in the ways um, that I suggest that we should use it um, and be cautious of the ways that it can go awry, uh, then I think the world can become a better place. So we do have one more question. Um, Joe, I don't know if I should just read it or if we unmute folks for this. Um, I think maybe given the time, it'd be efficient to just read it. If you oh, know. yes. OK. Yeah. Sorry, we're running out. So we have one question that says, I was curious if this kind of anger might constitute blame. And if so, if there is something morally dubious about allies, aspiring allies, to be blaming the dominant society for racism with the same kind of anger as Black people. Right, right. Right, right. I mean, I, I think I think it depends, right? So this is a loaded question because one might say, well, if, if it's if it's a blame emotion, then it may be hard, particularly as someone who benefits from white supremacy, to use all that blame um, against others and not direct it towards oneself. Um, so as much as I, I've described rage renegades as like a person who says that, hey, although they should benefit from racism, they're angry at such a society. One might say, well, perhaps they may be angry at themselves. It's something I haven't thought about. I mean, this is a very, very interesting question. So is it there's some self-blame in there? Um, that's a paper. That's a, that's a very interesting question. I want to think about that some more. Um, yeah, I want to think about that some more. That's a, that's a very rich question. Yeah, thank you for that question. Yeah. So we only have two minutes left. I, I do have one last question, but Joe, since you unmuted, is there something you wanted to jump in with? <laughs> no, I mean, I, I just wanted to, to, to probe and see your comments on this that notion that, you know, that emotions rarely or some, sometimes don't express as singular things, right? That there's mm -hmm. oftentimes this mixing of rage and anger and fear right. and mm -hmm. sadness and all right. of that together. So. Um, yeah, it just your thoughts on like uh, to what extent is your thinking around this framed and directed by the notion of rage versus sort of some potentially amalgamation of emotions that are being expressed here. Yeah, right. And that, that's what I think. The, I think the misconception is that people only feel anger, right? Mm -hmm. um, as if and, and so that's one one picture. And then another picture is um, they can only feel negative emotions at the same time, as if there's no room for positive. So they could say, "Hey, you're angry and fearful." But it's hard for them to imagine that you can be angry and sad, but full of compassion and full of love. And one of the things I'm trying to distangle that I do in the, the third chapter of the book is to say that not only is anger uh, compatible with a lot of these so-called positive emotions, um, they all, they're often complementary. They, 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 they often work together. And, and one of the ways that I like to describe it is like mixed martial arts. Uh, mixed martial arts, although I don't watch it, I'm familiar with the concept is that you use these kind of different martial art forms for any kind of situations, depending on the strengths and the weaknesses of your opponent. Whether they take you down on the ground, you're gonna use jujitsu. Whether you stand up, maybe you'll use 
karate or boxing, I don't know, right? But you wanna have a lot of stuff in your arsenal or in your toolkit. And I think us as human beings, we have a variety of emotions in our toolkit. And when it comes to fighting injustice, you may have anger directed towards the wrong door, but then you have compassion and love to, to those who are the victims of such wrongdoing, right? And then you also may have compassion towards the wrong door, right? And then you may have love for both. Right, a lot. I think these these emotions are complementary, and it suggests that if you have anger, you don't have love. I think is a, is a, I don't think that's tenable. Um, and I use Martin Luther King as a great example uh, um, of the untenability of that particular claim. And I, I want to remind folks um, that anger is not the antithesis of these so-called positive emotions, but but they are very much compatible and complementary, and using the expression of each other. Awesome. And, and at, oh, 101, I was about to say, right at the top. Um, <laughs> but uh, we kept you over one minute. Apologies for that. <laughs> but um, Professor Maisha Sherry from UC Riverside, her new book is The Case for Rage. Uh, I'm only two chapters in, and it's totally engaging. Philosophy of the Emotions, anti-racism, written for um, everyone, as far as I can tell. Really yes. accessible. So thank you very much, Dr. Sherry. Thank you all so much. Thank you all for your questions. <laughs>